record this on the computer. Okay, welcome, welcome. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, Professor. All right, well, let's rock and roll. It is week six, Wednesday, November 17th. I'm your host, Dr. Garayas. It is MED 210, Anatomy and Physiology 2, week six. What is, of course, due today? Any uh, uh, week five items, task five, discussion five, and lesson five. Check your email if you have not gotten your um, results uh, from your midterm or you have some questions about your midterm, uh, please shoot an email to me. And if you have not registered for term one, 2022, or don't know what classes, or don't even know who your academic advisor is, shoot me an email so I can find out. Um, a little bit of uh, quick news. Um, uh, for those of you who are my advisor, uh, advisee, I will be your advisor until January 7. Um, uh, I will, um, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm moving on uh, to another institution, uh, you know, next chapter in my academic career. Um, on, and my last day on campus will be, oh, not before, this campus will be January 7. So, uh, um, try to get registered, try to get everything done because I'm trying to wrap everything up and make sure um, um, uh, all my advisees get everything that they need, uh, especially your term one, 2022. And of course, um, all, everyone who's uh, applying for term one, 2022, um, deadline is tomorrow and good luck to everybody who have already submitted their names in. So what are we doing this week? Task six, this is movement and stability, the skeleton system. And of course, as the title suggests, it's the main, it's the main reason why we have bones. I gotta be able to move and I have to be able to sit uh, or stand upright. Um, anybody else on this call, if anybody who um, who's ever been, you know, who's ever had a broken bone, know that these two things go right out the window, even if you, uh, you know, uh, fracture your pinky bone. Uh, it's very difficult to move around and to walk around uh, when, when you have a fracture. Um, so those are the two main things, movement and stability. And also if I fractured any of my bones, I will not be able to stand up straight or to be able to sit up straight. So your movement and stability are the main functions of the skeletal system. It is chapter six. These videos are nice, especially uh, this one. This was a nice one. But, uh, and also, we'll also be going over the spaces in between two bones, which are joints. And there are three types. And there's a lovely video here. And that is chapter nine in your textbook. So chapter six and chapter nine. So let's begin. Let's go into our OpenStax textbook. Where are we? Table of contents, chapter four, five, six. So it's actually like chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine. So it's like four chapters. And before you start thinking to yourself, oh my God, it's so much. Uh, it, a lot of it is pictures and diagrams. So hint, hint, if I, mention, if I mention a diagram and show you a diagram, hint, hint, start studying that thing now uh, because it's definitely gonna come out in, um, in your final. So when we look at bone, of course, support, movement, and protection. Um, uh, when you fall, you don't just fall flat in your face. Your hands reach out. Your, uh, um, when, when someone's trying to stab you in the eyeball, what are you gonna, what's the first thing you do? Your hands go up, okay? Um, so it's also protection. And bone, we will discover it is a living, breathing thing. So it also has, uh, it's also hollow and has things in it. And one of the things that it has in it is the red marrow, which produces blood, red blood cells and white blood cells. 
and that's called hematopoiesis. And since it's also hollow, it stores and releases minerals and fat. Fat is stored in your bone in the form of yellow marrow. So red marrow, red blood cells, yellow marrow, fat. And of course, what makes bone hard and dense are the minerals like calcium, uh, uh, like calcium deposits that are also needed in, uh, for other things, but your bone also um, kind of stores it away. And we're gonna show you exactly where that happens. So it's not only, it's a living, breathing thing. It's not only support for your body. It's not only, um, um, what do you call that? It's not only like part of your structure to hold you up. It's also hematopoiesis and storage of uh, minerals and fat. And doesn't this, when you see a bulleted uh, item like this, doesn't this look like a beautiful all of the above question for uh, functions of bone? And when you're thinking about pathology, okay, I broke a major bone. What's going to happen? Well, I won't be able to support my body. Won't be able to move around too well. Won't be able to protect my internal organs. That's a real big problem. I'm going to have I'm going to have a red blood cell uh, problem and probably have anemia, right? And I'm going to also uh, have a mineral problem and a fat deposition problem. And red blood cells, mineral loss, and uh, fat rolling around uh, your third space or rolling around your uh, blood vessels, these are the primary concerns when you fracture uh, one of your major, um, uh, major uh, bones in your body. So knowing normal, again, yet another example that knowing normal will also help you remember abnormal. Look at this guy, doesn't even put on the plates. <sighs> Sadness. That's all right. Maybe it's his first day in back in the gym. Just kidding. Any weight that you put on here, right? And when you work out, okay? It's not only going to work out your, uh, your muscles, it also works out your bones. They're cousins. They, go, uh, they, uh, they work together. And um, if you're really, really into weight loss, um, working out the major uh, muscle groups, uh, like your quadriceps here, quad meaning four, there's a four, uh, set of four muscles here in your thigh bone, right? If you have more, uh, more muscle, more lean muscle, what's it going to do? It's going to eat up more glucose. It's just a little side note. So right now, very obvious. Brain is a very important thing. And your calvarium or your skull houses your brain and it protects it. Okay. So um, if you fracture that, that's a problem. Here is, um, it's a brace, but you could also see here that it has these little measurements here on the side. Um, there's something that's uh, similar to this and it's called a goniometer, and it measures uh, range of motion. That's what this reminds me of. Braces are nice. Here's that yellow marrow with the fat that I was talking about, and the red marrow, of course, will have hematopoiesis or um, uh, red, uh, the production of red blood cells. That's why when we put beef bones or anyone's into oxtail soup, or sopa de res, or from my country, uh, it's called bulalo. Uh, you soak uh, beef bones in a, in, to make a broth, and it tastes absolutely fabulous because what's inside the bones? You have blood that has salts in it, and you have yellow marrow that has fat in it, and that's what makes it taste totally fantabulous. Now I'm hungry. I wasn't hungry before, now I am. I just tricked myself into becoming ridiculously hungry. Wonderful. Now, bones can be classified into um, um, uh, different classifications. We're going to see some of the classifications this evening. And one of them is flat. If you look at your sternum or your breastbone, um, it's flat. It looks like a necktie. Necktie is flat. 
you also have bones that are long. Like here, this is your humerus. This is your uh, radius on your uh, thumb side, your ulna, which is your forearm bone on your, um, on your pinky side. You have your femur, the largest and longest bone in your body. And then you have your tibia, which is the big long shin bone, right? And your fibula, which is back here. All of them are long bones and they're part of your appendicular skeletal system. So your appendicular is your arms and your legs. Hence the term appendicular, which means appendages. You got another weird one here. This looks like uh, a sesame seed. It's sesamoid, oid, resembling what? A sesame, se sesame seed. And your patella or your kneecap right here, that is a sesamoid bone. If you look at your uh, ankles, which is your tarsals, and your uh, wrist, which is your carpals, you know, hence the term carpal tunnel syndrome, and you have your tarsals here, these bones are like cube-like, hence they, they're either called cuboidal or short bones. I remember them because when I look at them, they look like dice. Hence, the, hence also, I got to stop saying that. Um, you know, if they ever, if you, if any of you ever played uh, dice or CeeLo, sometimes we used to call them bones. Um, the utterly weird stuff that has bizarre shapes, they're called irregular bones. And a classic example of an irregular bone is your vertebrae right here, which is your backbone. What's another weird, uh, here's your sacrum. That's another weird one. Here's your uh, ischium and ilium, which is part of your hip. That's another weird one. Now, one really weird exception is your skull. You may think your skull might be irregular, but it's actually flat. Think about your skull as like a pancake that got molded into like this dome that's right here. And so the skull is considered a flat bone. So this is uh, nice to know. Uh, and it does come out in uh, regarding classifications of bones. Look at here. And they have uh, a nice uh, chart that gives you um, examples. So good on examples. And it's the best to use it visually. Long, short, flat, regular, and sesamoid. Now let's look at your classic long bone and its parts. So when you're looking at this femur, it's got a top, a top proximal end. So this is, this is your uh, thigh bone. And this end connects into your, what they call your acetabulum of your, uh, of your hip bone. And this end, uh, connects into your kneecap and then your tibia and your fibula on the on the distal end. So the proximal end, closer to your hip, distal end, closer to your knee. You have the main shaft here in the middle, that's called your diaphysis. And then meta means change. So you have this area of change from your metaphysis to your epiphysis. Epi means on top of. And the proximal epiphysis has to be the one that's closest to your hip. And your distal epiphysis has to be the one closest to your kneecap, or also known as your patella. And you will also notice at the ends of the epiphyses, both distal and proximal, there is articular cartilage. Now, cartilage is made up of the same stuff, just like bone, but bone has way more minerals like magnesium sulfate, calcium carbonate, uh, things of that matter. And with the more minerals, it gets really hard. But the articular cartilage is a little bit softer, well, a lot softer, more rubber-like. And you could see why it's articular cartilage. It will protect uh, wear and tear uh, on the epiphyseal ends of the long bone. Mine is like, they said it was like 40% worn away because, you know, uh, I run and I move around a lot. 
Here's the articular cartilage on the proximal epiphysis. So now you now know the importance of cartilage. One of them, it's uh, used as a shock absorber slash uh, 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 friction reducer, for lack of a better term. Now we already went to, now, if you look at the different kinds of bones, you have compact bone, which is this stuff, right? And you have spongy bone. We saw an example of spongy bone earlier that had the red marrow and the yellow marrow inside of it. And here is a, a spongy bone, red marrow. Now on the metaphysis, you have this little line when you're a kid, it's called an epiphyseal plate. When you're an adult, it's called an epiphyseal line. The line solidifies when you stop growing. But when you were a kid, this is the epiphyseal plate is this area right here in the area of your metaphysis. That's the place where you grow, where you, where you, where you grow from. Just like your heart and your lungs and everything, there are layers and um, the, the layers on the outer outside are much stronger than the layers on the in, inside. So you have spongy bone, it's more open, there's little spaces. On the outside is compact bone, it's tougher. And the outside bone has a, 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 layer, a layer, right? You can see it here, right? Called your periosteum. Your periosteum is very, very tough versus your uh, endosteum here of your compact bone. And your spongy bone is even less tough uh, than your periosteum and your endosteum. So your endosteum is the layer on the endo or within inside of your compact bone or your diaphysis. And your periosteum covers the entire outer shell and that protects the entire bone. And uh, you could also see here as a classic example, we're gonna show more examples that your bone is a living, breathing thing. There are holes in it where nutrient arteries, veins, nerves, and um, also uh, lymphatic tissue go in and out. So that's how you can get cancer. Uh, if your liver cells can get cancer, if your stomach cells can get cancer, well, guess what? So can bone cells. And bone cells, just like your heart cells, need to live. So they have an artery, vein, nerve, and lymphatic tissue associated with it, and that goes inside and out. So it, bone isn't just like, you know, like a leg on a table. It's not a solid thing. It's a, it's a solid thing on the outside but on the inside it's hollow and uh, there's a lot of uh, activity and uh, physiology going on uh, inside here. Okay, so now you know, doesn't this look like a beautiful picture that has a whole bunch of parts and all those parts have a whole bunch of potential um, uh, physiology slash function. This is a beautiful thing. You could take this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Hey, watch this. Can I go home? Do this. Uh, let's see what what picture it looks just like ours. Oh, looky here. Can I do this? Happy Turkey Day, amped up, right? I'm not, don't pay for this, but. Right, it's right here, and you screenshot it. Not not too difficult, and then do what? Practice it all day, every day. Because what are the odds this might potentially come out? Pretty darn good. And also, for future reference, you need to know things. So let's look at bone cells, because we I just mentioned that the bone right, it has little holes, it's hollow, and uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, it's, a, it's a living, breathing thing. So let me tell you about your bone cells. So 
we do it in a way that's just like just like your uh, concept. So you have your mature bone cell. Okay. That's called your osteocyte. This is mature. It's the full grown bone cell that will, you know, do all, all the functions of, uh, of what you need to be a bone, a skeleton. Well, its precursor, the immature bone cell is called your osteoblast. So, of course, from osteoblast, you have immature cells, they grow. And you know, the difference between an immature cell and a mature cell, immature cell, it's brand new, it's growing. They can't do much. You're immature, you're not mature enough. And then it becomes a mature cell. Well, when you get past your prime, what happens? You gotta be recycled out. So, then you have your osteoclast. It's a cell that's gonna break down bone. Okay, and then recycle its products and create what? An, uh, an immature osteoblast. So this whole process here is called remodeling. This is the reason why little kids don't break bones real easy. And this is also the reason why when we were all younger, you could fall off of, you know, I don't know, what stupid thing that I do when I was a kid. Oh yeah, I was riding my skateboard on top of a UPS truck. Don't ask me how I did it. Well, they were parked. And I was thinking of jumping from one UPS truck to another and I missed and I fell from that height, hit my head on the uh, adjacent UPS truck and on the way down, not a single fracture. Why? This is also the reason why bones are strong because it has the ability to replace either dead, dying, or damaged osteocytes or mature bone cells by breaking them down with these cells called osteoclasts. The osteoclasts then take down the breakdown products and then make immature cells. Now, this cycle is quite efficient when you're young. When you get older, what happens? Your body starts favoring breakdown versus building up, right? But this whole entire process is called remodeling. That's why bone is stronger than steel because if I take a jackhammer to steel, the steel will bend and it will break. It doesn't repair itself. Human bone repairs itself. So I could ask, what's an osteocyte? You'll tell me mature cell, mature bone cell. What's an osteoclast? It's the bone cell that breaks down um, a bone. And what's an osteoblast? That's a cell that is the immature cell that will mature to become the osteocyte. Now, another function of the osteoclast, remember we talked about those minerals that make bone bone, uh, like calcium and magnesium? Well, we, we need calcium every once in a while. Well, guess who breaks down some of the bone so that the calcium can get you know, released. Guess who's also involved in such disease states such as osteoporosis, when there is a, when your bone becomes porous and then there's too much breakdown and too much calcium and magnesium gets leaked out. And that's an osteoporosis and that will make a weaker bone structure. So to recap, this is, re, this is, this process here is called remodeling and these are the three types of cells involved. Huh? 
Now, another thing you'll notice is, do you see how the bone matrix is in concentric circles? The way it's also sandwiched, where all the compact bone is on the outside, all the spongy bone is in the inside like a sandwich, which by the way, if you've ever looked at one of the hardest, most lightest substances known to world, known the world that makes like fighter jets nowadays is, car is carbon, uh, carbon mesh fiber. Guess what that got remodeled after? Human bone. And that's what gives bone. It has a lot of strength, but it's really light. And the fact that this thing remodels itself. Okay. And going back to this, what I was mentioning earlier, have you ever taken a, a newspaper, right? If I just take a, a, a newspaper and then, uh, you know, we all loose and then I, um, uh, you know, I hit you on the head with it. You look at me like, what are you doing? It didn't hurt me. But if I take that same newspaper and roll it up real nice and tight, just like these, um, uh, these, um, these, these bone cells, what's going to happen? It's going to form these layers and it's going to get really hard and it can hurt you. And it's very, very strong. All of these bones, there's markings on it, and there's things. And for just uh, just for your edification, just for completion, just know that if I show you a bone like your femur, like I just showed you, those are the basic basic parts, of, you know, of the skeleton, which I say, you know, epiphysis, diaphysis, and all that. Those are basic parts. But every bone has all these little extra things, like articulations, head, facet, condyle projections, protuberances, processes, spines, tubercle, tuberosities, lines, press, hole. And hole is another hole uh, uh, is called foramen. This is the term for hole. And for future reference, that's how, that's how more complicated that this particular chapter is going to get. Like, like um, there's, there's whole month chapter just on the foramen or the holes in your head. There are, there are dozens of them and there are blood vessels and um, nerves that pass through them and knowing uh, all those nerves and all that stuff. But that's for future training. For right now, if I don't mention the hole or the fossa, which is um, you know a, a depression um, or a groove or an opening like meatus, uh, uh, just know that this training is basic and there, there's more training to come in your future career if you want to get, uh, if you want to move higher up uh, along your uh, clinical career. Because there's a whole bunch, see, here's a classic example. There's a whole bunch of things like proximal head, which part of the proximal head, there's specific, there's specific tubercles, sulci, uh, uh, fossa, because these, all of these things connect into things, right? Facet, tubercle, the, the all, you gotta memorize all of them. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, like, uh, like a fossa is like a, a depression, like a ditch, a, a, a basin, if you will. And a crest is something like, you know, like, like, on, like on top of a mountain, like a ridge, like a ridge line. You also have sinuses in your head or in your skull. It's the reason why when you get sinusitis, your head feels like a bowling ball and uh, your hearing goes really bad. This is also the reason why um, you not only hear with your ears, you hear through bone conduction. And um, if your sinuses are all clogged up, that's why uh, you know your um, things are gonna sound funny to you and your head's gonna feel heavy. And uh, it is also the reason why you believe your your speaking and your singing voice is the most beautiful thing, not only because we all have egos, but uh, you're also listening to your voice through the most elaborate, beautiful, and symmetric, by the way, um, uh, speaker the, uh, the world has ever seen. If you look at like, uh, what's, a, what's a really expensive speaker, like Clippage, 
Um, you, if you look, if you look inside, it's called baffles or the little rooms inside high-end speakers. They, they're all rounded and they kind of look like this. It's kind of neat. Osteocyte, osteoblast, uh, uh, stem cell, right? Which is uh, also, um, is the precursor to the osteoblast, right? And osteoclasts break down bone and that's also known as resorption because sometimes I need to break down some bone to go get at what's inside of it. And the main uh, breakdown product that we like is calcium. Okay, a nice little, um, what do you call it? There's a chart. Now, remember I told you about that newspaper that gets all wound up? Well, uh, microscopically, there's all these little twigs in compact bone that get wound up and they all get tied up together. It's easy to break one twig, but if you tie them all together, it gets pretty strong. And these little mini twigs is called an osteon. And in, you can see inside the middle of the osteon, there are these canals and they're called Haversian canals. Within the Haversian canal, look what you have in there. You have a vein, an artery, a nerve, and the green is, lymph is a, a lymphatic vessel. And they're all interconnected, okay? In concentric lamellae or what they call concentric layers. Lamellae is just a fancy term for, uh, for layers. Right? So it looks like a whole bunch of trees get, get all strapped together and you got something that's really, really strong. And it's living, it's breathing. It requires nutrients, it can feel. That's why I break your bone, you're not gonna move very well and it's gonna cause a lot of pain. If I break bone, blood's gonna start leaking everywhere. If I break bone, what's going to happen to my lymphatic system? It's also going to be broken. So that area that got, that got fractured is also now in danger of infection. Now, you can see how one thing leads to another, leads to another called sequelae. So you got to look at pathology in terms of that. But for right now, normal, this is what normal looks like. A whole bunch of osteons or functional units of bone and what's inside the middle. Does that look like a beautiful all of the above question? Uh, 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 Paget's disease, again, we're not gonna focus on any. Um, here's another example. Look, all this blood vessels, all in between uh, the, the spongy sections of your, uh, of, of a typical long bone and it's got to exit the long bone. So there's going to be foramen and there's going to be little holes that go in and out. Now, how does it ossify? Well, we're not, we're not going to go into that, but just know that the only difference between cartilage and actual bone is the amount of mineral de deposition that it has. So real bone, has more calcium, more magnesium, and all these other nutrient, um, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, nutrient slash minerals, and cartilage has less. And that's why cartilage is more spongy and bone is more, uh, is, is uh, you know, is stronger and, and more and, and harder. I'm trying to look for a fancy academic word and just say the word, it's just tougher and harder. It's, it's easier to say trying to be fancy schmancy uh, we're gonna do this how bones go we also call, talked about remodeling how they repair itself oh by the way you exercise regularly it promotes remodeling that's why if you're in a place that has no gravity or you lead a very very sedentary lifestyle like you're, you're essentially a couch potato, what's going to happen to your bones? They will remodel less. Remember, if you don't use it, you lose it. But also, if you use it too much, what's going to happen? Your bone is going to start wearing away and start favoring osteoclasts versus osteoblasts. So again, too much of a good thing, 
bad. Too little of a good thing, bad. There must be balance. Now, this is what happens when you become unbalanced. You get fractures. You have closed versus open. Of course, open is when the fracture is sticking out of your skin. This has massive uh, potential for infection. We like closed better because it's not breaking into the skin and so that all the bacteria on the outside stay on the outside. Transverse, that means the fracture goes straight across. Spiral, of course, in an oblique or diagonal uh, pattern. I mean, um, spiral is, sorry, now I'm mixing up two things. Spiral is when these two parts twist, you know, uh, like a can. Comminuted is a kind of fracture that has a lot of bits and pieces. Classic comminuted fracture is secondary to GSW, also known as gunshot wound. The gunshot, the, the bullet, yes, it's dangerous, but what's way more dangerous than the bullet is the shock wave and potential energy that the bullet carries. And in order for you to uh, comminute uh, bone bits like this, which is actually very hard to heal, very hard to uh, control the uh, infection, um, the, the bullet doesn't necessarily have to hit that bone. It's gotta come close and the shock wave of that bullet will actually fracture, especially if it's like something big and fast like a rifle round. Impacted, that's when um, impacted, the classic example of it is usually, you know, people who jump off of, uh, like a, from a height uh, or they try to commit suicide, it shoves all the, um, uh, all the energy up towards the shaft of, this is your femur, and you can also have similar impacted fractures on your, um, uh, your, 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 your vertebra or your, you know, uh, on your spine. Green stick are particular to pediatrics, usually in children less than five years of age, because kids don't have a lot of mineral deposition. And, um, you know, it's fractured on one side, but bendy on the other, just like a, a green stick. You know, if you've ever seen a, uh, um, a, a new sapling from a tree or a bush, when you break it, it breaks on one side and it just bends on the other. And that's a green stick fracture, usually pediatrics, usually... Uh, a child less than five years of age. An oblique, where I already explained to you, that's diagonal. So those are your wonderful types of fractions. Now, let's look at some of the, since it's bone is hollow, let's look at some of the other uh, functions of bone. Of course, we already know it stores calcium, makes sense. Now, in addition to uh, uh, storing calcium, right, it also uh, deals with uh, vitamin D synthesis, but not in the way you'd think. Sunlight hits your skin, right? Of course, you know, too little sunlight, not a good thing. You'll get vitamin D deficiency. You're going to have skin problems and you're also going to have uh, bone problems. So you get vitamin D from sunlight and also uh, from, uh, from, of course, your diet. And your bone synthesizes vitamin D, which facilitates calcium absorption. So if you recall the definition of what a vitamin is, it is a... Um, um, a What's the word I'm looking for? My goodness, what's with my English this evening? Um, what is the word I'm looking for? Well, in all chemical processes, you always need uh, an accelerant or um, you know some kind of enzyme. And vitamin D is what they call, or all vitamins are coenzymes. So. You need vitamin D, which is a coenzyme, will help in calcium absorption. Also, calcium uh, resorption, or uh, when we're breaking down bone, when we need calcium. We also need calcium for muscles and especially for your heart. So you, it, it's, it's one of those things you need vitamin D, right? And who else is involved? 
of course, your liver, which is a major metabolic organ, and also your kidneys, right? Which, uh, um, uh, which uh, messes with uh, message messes with the hormone cal calcitriol to make the active biological vitamin form of vitamin D. So when you're looking at this, this is a wonderful picture. We need vitamin D. I get it from two sources, but the major source is sunlight. And it is a coenzyme that facilitates calcium absorption, which makes my bodies, which makes my bones stronger. And it also um, uh, facilitates uh, muscle movement. My liver is involved and my kidney is involved. And the kidney takes calcitriol and goes uh, and then um, converts it into the active form, the biologically active form uh, known as vitamin D. Other nutrients that are in there, vitamin K, which is really big on uh, blood clotting. Okay. Uh, oh, here. Oh, so, look at this. They have a nice little thing. So remember, magnesium, structural component of bone, also calcium as well. You have your also phosphates as well, right? Omega-3 fatty acids are wonderful, but don't just take squalene or, or fish oils. You have to get it derived from actual diet, actual fish. And of course, fluoride is a, a nice uh, trace element that also deals with the structural components and gives the, 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 the strength to bone. So give the strength to bone. What gives bone strength? Fluoride, magnesium, calcium phosphate, calcium carbonate. Those are all the things that differentiate bone versus cartilage. Bone has a lot of these things. Cartilage, not as much. Uh, let's talk about other hormones. Of course, growth hormone, okay, from your pituitary gland is going to promote osteoblasts and promote osteocytes. And by the way, growth hormone, especially in children, gets activated during stage four REM, or also known as REM stage sleep. So that thing that you, you know, whoever, whoever raised you uh, said to you that, hey, because uh, you don't sleep, you're gonna end up, you're gonna end up a little person. My mom used to always say that to me. This is from a woman who's 4'11". And then I stopped growing, I think I was 11 or 12. I was like 5'3 when I was 11. And then I think I, and then I just stopped growing. But that's also partially genetics. Uh, other hormones, oh, let's look at hormones. We already talked about growth hormone, that's obvious. It's gonna improve growth. Thyroxin, if you recall, we talked about how um, the thyroid gland is really important in uh, metabolism. And it's also important in uh, a growth hormone. Sex hormones, remember puberty, that's also important. Calcitriol, we already talked about that regarding calcium. And uh, parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoclasts. Parathyroid hormone goes, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. If I need calcium, parathyroid hormone gets activated. And calcitonin, if I need to store calcium, calcitonin is going to tell the osteoclast, hey, stop that. Stop breaking down bone. I need to uptake, calci uh, uptake and keep calcium. So parathyroid, I want you to think, I need calcium. It's going to get released and get uh, and resor bone resorption will happen. So I'm going to get some calcium from my bones. But calcitonin does the exact opposite. Oh, here. Here is a classic homeostasis model. We already know that. So what happens? I have uh, increased calcium level, right? Normal is around 10 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, thyroid gland it goes, releases calcitonin. Osteoclast activity is inhibited. Calcium reabsorption in the uh, kidneys is decreased. Then therefore the uh, calcium blood level Go, uh, will decrease if I have too much. So if you look at here, the impetus is here is increased calcium level greater than 10 milligrams per deciliter. So this thing will happen. But this is a situation where I have decreased calcium level less than 10 milligrams per deciliter. Then parathyroid kicks in. 
Osteoclasts release calcium from bone. That's called bone resorption, right? Calcium is then reabsorbed by the, uh, from the urine into the kidneys. Remember that function of the kidneys? And then calcium absorption in the small intestine, vitamin D synthesis, increase the cal uh, calcium blood levels. And bring everyone back to where? 10 milligrams per deciliter, which is homeostasis. This is a wonderful physiology diagram. Hint, hint. And also remember, one of these days, you're going to have to remember that 10 milligrams uh, for calcium levels, because even though your um, normal levels are already in the lab reports, sometimes the lab reports are off and uh, um, a good clinician has to know uh, normal value. Okay, and uh, that's it for that chapter. Let's look at chapter seven look at some more divisions of, uh, I mentioned this right here. Lovely, lovely diagram, ripe for an exam, hint, hint, okay? Now, this particular division, if you see all the ones here in kind of like uh, this greenish gray, these are your appendicular skeletal system. So your hips, and your legs and your shoulder and your arms down to your fingers. So let's do the um, upper extremity um, appendicular skeletal system first. It starts up here with your shoulder girdle. Now, what's a girdle? A girdle is anything that wraps around something, just like you know the just like the undergarment of you know the 1860s. I don't, I don't think if anyone wears girdles anymore, but it wraps around things. So your sh shoulder girdle wraps around here, also known as your pectoral girdle. So what do you have? This thing that kind of looks like a scalpel, it's called your scapula or your shoulder blade. Here, your clavicle, or your, also known as your collarbone, then gets connected to your humerus. And we mentioned these bones as well. Thumb side is your uh, radius. Pinky side is ulna, and then you have your uh, uh, metacarpals, carpals, and your fingers are called phalanges, and your toes are also called phalanges. So how do you know we're talking about your fingers or your toes? When we say phalanges upper extremity, we're talking about your fingers. If I say phalanges lower extremity, I'm talking about your toes. Your upper extremities and your lower extremities are numbered. So your thumb is numbered one, pink, I mean, and your pinky is number five. So if I fractured my thumb here on my patient, it would be fracture uh, first phalange left upper extremity. That's how we label it in the chart, okay? Now that is your upper extremity and appendicular skeletal system. Your uh, lower extremity appendicular skeletal system, of course, um, includes your pelvic girdle. We're going to be going over that bone momentarily, right? Your ischium and your ilium. You have your femur, the largest, longest long bone in your body, your patella, the sesamoid bone, your tibia, and the smaller one in the fibula. Now you fracture this tibia. The odds of you also fracturing uh, the posterior fibula is also good, hence the term tib-fib fracture. You also have here your ankle bones, tarsals, then metatarsals here, which is the dorsum of your foot, and of course, your phalanges. Your big toe will be labeled phalange, uh, phalanges, uh, number one, lower extremity, and on this patient, left. Now, your axial skeletal system comprises of your bone, your spinal cord, and your rib cage, and we're gonna go over um, the skull, uh, rib cage, or your thoracic cage, and your uh, vertebrae in greater detail momentarily. So this beautiful, hint, hint, it's a great, great pick. Brain case or your calvarium, and here's your facial bones. Let's go over the ones I like, and let's, let's keep it very basic. You don't need to know all the little holes, like all the foramen or, or all that. What do you need to know? 
this big bone here, this pink, that's your frontal bone. The ones on the side, you got a pair of them, is your parietal. These big holes here for your eye sockets, that is your orbit, okay? You have a bone right here where it's for your, uh, uh, for your uh, lacrimal duct, that's called your uh, lacrimal bone for your tear ducts. That's why it connects directly into your nose. That's why when you start crying and all the tears start going to your nose, that's why your nose starts uh, dripping out stuff. Zygomatic, which is your cheekbones. You have your maxilla, which is the upper part of your, uh, uh, your like, well, the upper part here of your, including your teeth and your mandible, which is your jaw right down here, okay? So just know the ones that I just talk, talked about, basic, basic. You don't need to know every little thing here. But eventually, you're going to have to know every little thing there for future training. And that is the frontal view of your skull, also known as your cranium, also known as the very top part is also known as your calvarium. Now, you'll recall, I think we're going to have a, a, a better picture of the fontanelles, but we'll, we'll go over these picture. And we're going to go over the soft spots in the baby's head. And they're also called fontanelles. For this picture, what looks good? Of course, your frontal bone, one of the pair of your parietal bones. Right here is your temporal bone. You have your external acoustic meatus. This is going to uh, lead into your ear canal, your inner ear, right? You have your mastoid process or this little thing that's sticking out here. The bone in the back is called your occipital. Here's another view of your maxilla. Here's another view of your mandible on this lateral side view, okay? Here's a view of your cheekbones or your zygomatic, which is right here, okay? Now you got this little part of your sphenoid bone and on the inside of your eye socket, you have your ethmoid bone. Nice to know. Now, what else do you need to know? Remember I mentioned soft spots or fontanelles. If you, uh, you know, you look at a newborn, you feel their skull, it's kind of soft because, you know, it isn't fully formed yet. And there's spaces. Well, the spaces eventually close up and they form these joints called sutures. These are immo immovable sutures. They don't move. So the ones in the back between your occipital bone and your parietal bone, that's called your lambo lambdoid structure because when you look at the posterior view, it forms a triangle. What's triangle? Lambda in, in Greek letters. So that's your lambdoid suture. Then you have this suture here, which is your squamous. And then you have this main suture here, which is your coronal, because that's where your crown is, right on top of your head, okay? They all form together into uh, this juncture here called your terion, okay? So those are the major features and very basic features of the lateral view or side view of your skull. Here's the inner view of your skull. And you could see it has an anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. You also have this big hole here where your spinal cord and your spinal column should go through. And that is called your foramen magnum. Foramen means whole, magnum means big. Fossa means depression or this, you know, this little ditch. You have an anterior part, a middle part, and a posterior part. And looky, looky here. It, your brain fits in perfectly. And your brain has a forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain that fits into the anterior, middle, and posterior. See? Everything for a reason. And you'll notice that there's a space that separates your brain from the rest of your calvarium. And that's important because that whole entire space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. It not only uses a communication fluid, it's also used as a nice buffer. So if I crack my skull, which is pretty, you know, it's relatively hard and, and can protect it, my brain doesn't get hit immediately or hurt immediately. Here's the under view, and here's another view of your foramen magnum. You could see also a whole bunch of views of all of these uh, foramen and processes and miata and miati 
uh, all of them have, this gives me flashbacks. All of them have functions. All of them have arteries, veins, and nerves that go through them. And they all relate to a whole bunch of pathologies. But just know that from the inferior view of the skull, the most important thing that you need to know is your foramen magnum right here. Here's another uh, more specific view of the uh, internal structures of your anterior, middle, and posterior fossa. Uh, but man, eh, nice to know. Again, you know, for future training, not not really for my exam. And look at this is a different view, the posterior view. You see, this is the lambdoid uh, suture because you got to use your imagination. Look in your this is your uh, occipital bone. It's looks like a triangle. And then you have your sagittal suture, which splits your, uh, your parietal bones into a left and right. Remember the coronal, the crown one is the one up front. Nice to know, nice to know, nice to know. Should I go over this? Mm, nah, nice to know. Hmm, orbits, mm, no, nasal septum. Oh, here. The front part of your nose is septal cartilage because it can't be stiff. Because if I broke the nose, I won't have a patent airway. You'll also, right here is your brain. Okay. You can also see how close your brain is to your nasal, uh, uh, your nasal passages, which go, which go through here. That's why um, uh, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about it in uh, in like week eight about special senses about um, uh, the sense of smell. It's also the reason why people snort cocaine. What what, what other things do people snort? Heroin, um, um, uh, Xanax tabs. You crush them and you snort them because the nerves to your brain, they go to your um, olfactory processes, is right here, it goes right through. And here's another frontal sinus here. Remember, there are sinuses or spaces in your skull. It makes your skull light or lighter. Okay. And another view of your sinuses or your paranasal sinuses, because this is your bone and they're alongside of your um, nose or your nose bone. Hyoid bone, that's that extra bone that's right here, it's floating, okay? And its function really is for um, uh, attachments to the muscles for your tongue, larynx, and pharynx. Remember your larynx is your voice box, pharynx is your throat. Ooh, look at here. Let us look at the spine. The spine is part of your axial skeletal system. There are four types. There are seven, C1 through C7, and those are your seven cervical vertebrae. If you now feel the back of your neck, you know, on the top of your neck, there's a little bump sticking out, that's your seventh cervical vertebrae or your uh, seventh cervical prominence. Now your thoracic vertebrae, there are 12 of them because there are 12 ribs. And the thoracic vertebrae, I'm gonna show you in a moment, they have these things called facets that attach to the ribs. And that's how you know the thoracic. You'll also notice that the cervical vertebrae, they're really, they're smaller and lighter than the rest of them. Uh, especially, and I'm gonna also show you more specifics, your cervical one and cervical two, which is your atlas and your axis. And that gives you the ability to either nod your head yes or no, which is your atlas, your your cervical one, or left to right, how to say no, uh, that's your uh, axis, which is your uh, cervical two vertebrae. You have five lumbar, one, two, three, four, five. Then you have, uh, I think it's four to six, I can't remember, uh, uh, um, fused bones called your sacrum. And at the very, very end, you have your coccyx or your tailbone. Let's look at uh, these bones in a little bit greater detail. 
Uh, here's some pathologies. If it starts, if you look at the, your, your patient and you look at them from, the, uh, from a posterior to an anterior view or the back to front view, you'll see there's going to be a curvature of the spine, misalignment of uh, their scapula, and that's called scoliosis. Uh, kyphosis is uh, called humpback and lordosis is called swayback. Okay. And lordosis gets really, really prominent, especially uh, if uh, mommy's pregnant or, you know, if you're like me, you got a lot of stuff in the front and it's going to pull uh, all this musculature this way and cause, cause a little bit of pain. Not a little bit, a lot, actually. So let's look at some uh, some some features of of um, your vertebrae. Okay, you're gonna see these things. There's processes that are sticking out and little arches. Here's your spinal cord. What's coming out of your spinal cord are spinal nerves. They're also associated with these uh, cartilage intervertebral discs, also known as your IV disc, um, and uh, you can also see these uh, things that are also sticking out. That's also called lamina. Every once in a while, we got to cut these things and perform a laminectomy because you have impingement on the spinal nerve, which can either cause paralysis, pain, or both, right? And um, all of this is bone, but you see this gray stuff here? Your intervertebral disc is made out of cartilage, and it, it provides as a shock absorber for your... Um, um, uh, for your uh, vertebral bodies, you can see here. And inside the middle, it's called the nucleus propulsus. So when this disc gets out of alignment and this nucleus propulsus starts pushing out, hence the pathological term herniated disc, or what your patient calls a slip disc. Okay. Now you look at the different vertebrae you look at the cervical ones, they're very, very small and thin and light. Your C1 is your atlas. That gives you your ability to nod your head up and down. If my patient cannot nod their head up and down, I'm gonna suspect a C1 fraction. C2, which is your axis or your cervical two, that's when you can't move your head left to right. If you, my patient can't do that, or if there's pain and swelling involved in that, that means I'm looking at a C2 fracture uh, of their cervical vertebrae. And you can see how small and delicate they are. Right? It's, it's kind of easy to break your neck. If you look at your thoracic vertebrae, they have these uh, facets, these little connections here that will connect into your ribs. There are 12 of these bad boys because you have 12 ribs. And of course the lumbar, what's important about the lumbar you could see how pronounced the body of your lumbo, lumbar um, um, vertebrae are because they're very, very strong because this has to also help support your body weight when you stand up or when you sit up. Then you have the fused bones, which is your sacrum, and it ends in the, uh, your tailbone, which is called your coccyx. And see this? All these holes here, all this sac uh, sacral... Uh, uh, for Raymond, your uh, sacral nerves go through there. So if you fracture this part, you're gonna have not, you're gonna have a whole bunch of problems with your genital urinary system because your S2 through S4 also controls your genital urinary system and also contributes to, um, you know, the muscles that signal your legs to move. Here is a classic example of a nucleus propulsus or a herniated disc, also known as a slip disc. You could see the compression of the spinal nerve, not a good thing. So every once in a while, we gotta take, do a laminectomy. I cut this, this alleviates the pressure. And then, you know, we try to push this back in there. Of course, this is your spinal cord and your spinal nerves. The the, the very dangerous thing about all of this, when you, when you fracture your, uh, your, your vertebral bones, any cut or damage into this, or even the swelling, 
could um, uh, could give um, uh, permanent or semi-permanent paralysis and also permanent and semi-permanent pain states. Okay. Oh, let's look at your um, sternum or breastbone. This part of this, I always think it's like a tie, like a, you know, like a like a suit and tie. And that, and you're a man and you wear a suit and tie. So that's your manubrium, the corpus or body, and it ends in a cartilaginous tip there called your xiphoid process. Xiphoid process is particularly important because this is where we measure up with our fingers to do CPR. You have 12 ribs. Now, they should have colored this better. This light sandy brown versus this darker brown. The darker brown is, um, uh, what do you call that? I don't like this picture. No, let's get a better one. Uh-oh, my keyboard's running out of uh... It's running out of uh... Okay. So of course we have your manubrium sternum. Uh, you have your corpus and you have your xiphoid process. If you look at the, the anterior portion of your ribs, those are cartilage. And because of this cartilage, there's certain classification. You have the true ribs, your false ribs, and your false ribs, and your floating ribs. Your true ribs, ribs one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you could see they connect directly into your sternum, hence the term true ribs. False ribs eight, nine, and 10 connect in the front to your rib number seven. Do you see how uh, 10, nine, and eight kind of connect into like seven here? They're all together. And then ribs one through 10, your true ribs and your false ribs have connections to both your sternum and to your uh, spinal cord in the back, right? It is your floating ribs, which is its main function is to protect your posterior located kidneys. Those are the ones that are only connected into your um, thoracic 11 and thoracic 12 vertebrae in the back. And that's, uh, that's your anatomy of ribs. I kind of like this picture better because, or even this picture better because you could see the difference. Now, it begs the question, okay, whoever made us, why in heaven's name did they put cartilage here? Why didn't they just make this all solid? Well, everyone take a deep breath. You feel your chest move up and out every time you inhale? Well, that's why. And uh, your, your, um, your thoracic cage has to be able to move. Also now, try it. Move left to right. You know, do little trunk twists. That's why you also have to have cartilage here in your intervertebral disc, also known as your IV disc. Okay, so you have your true ribs, your false ribs, and thoracic 11 and 12, those are your uh, floating ribs. Again, another beautiful picture. See, do, do you notice we're not even reading anything? It's all pictures, a lot of anatomy. Here are your fontanelles. So if I show you this picture, you'll know that this is a picture of a skull of a newborn and not an alien, even though babies kind of look like aliens to me, right? So these fontanelles are the spaces or the soft spots. And actually in, um, in pediatrics, we use these as um, um, uh, clinical landmarks of how the baby's uh, bone and growth development occur when these things start closing up. So fontanelles, think infant, newborn, okay? And uh, you have an anterior one and you have a posterior one. You also have one kind of on the sides, but, but the two main ones that we look at are the anterior and the posterior. And, they're, and these spaces are called fontanelles. When the child grows and the bones start fusing together, those then, these lines will then be called sutures. 
Okay. We're done with seven. Let's look at the pictures in eight. And we kind of looked at them already, but we're gonna look at it a little bit closer. Okay. So you look here. Is your clavicle? All right, this is a, ah, I like this one better. Right here, if you look at the anterior section, here's your clavicle. Your scapula is located posteriorly and they, uh, they connect here. And so does your humerus. That's why for baseball players, uh, this is your um, uh, rotator cuff area where you have your, you know, your, your sits muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and your subscapularis. And that all helps together with all those muscles. And that is your shoulder girdle. And you can see here for future stuff, there's way more detail. And all of this connects to specific bones, not bones, uh, specific muscles. And for future, uh, for graduate school training, you have to memorize all of these things. That's why I highly suggest if you're going into a gross anatomy for, for graduate school, medical school or advanced nursing, um, get Mosby's um, Anatomy and Physiology coloring book. It's really neat. I swear by it, my, sister's, uh, my sister who also graduated in a nursing program swears by it, my daughter, uh, who else was in nursing? Um, my my, my brother-in-law, they all went through it and they all colored that coloring book. Someone told me they, they now color in medical school, but when I was in medical school, no time to go coloring stuff. It's pretty much sink or swim, memorize, memorize everything. Well, it's just silly because you'll forget it. Uh, okay. Here is your uh, upper extremity appendicular skeletal system in a little bit more, a um, little bit more detail. You, the dorsum of your hand or the back of your hand is called the metacarpals, and your um, the cuboidal bones of your wrist are called carpals. And again. You don't need to memorize these. This is for well, when when you know whenever you you know go to graduate school. The first digit is labeled one, two, three, four, five, and uh, sometimes the thumb is called your pollux or your pollicis or pollicis. Um, and if you look at your phalanges, uh, with the exception of uh, the thumb, you have a distal, middle, and proximal. So your patient could fracture the distal. Distal, distal third, middle third, uh, or proximal third of your phalanges. And this is coincidentally, the one I pointed at is your third digit upper extremity left. This is my patient's left hand. This is my patient's right. Oops, sorry, Mike. See, it's just the left hand, but they turned it around. I'm assuming that, um, I'm assuming too much. Now, how does carpal tunnel work? Because it's a very, very common thing, especially for those of us who are gonna be working with our hands a lot, lifting patients and, and doing a lot of technical things with our hands and a lot of charting on, uh, on keyboards all day, every day. Well, your carpal bones are here, right? Those are your wrist. And in your wrist, your, uh, your tendon right here, which is called your flexor retinaculum, it forms like a bridge or like a tunnel in here. And if you overuse your hands, this tendon collapses and then impinges on this nerve, which then impinges on these bones back here. Then you'll have a pinched nerve and then you'll start uh, manifesting in either muscle weakness and or pain and or sensory deficit in your fingers. Um, and if it's ulnar nerve, you're going to feel it in your uh, pinky and your fourth digit, right? Your ring finger. And if it's um, 
uh, your radial nerve, you're going to feel it in your thumb, first and second digit. I mean, your thumb, second and third digit. Thumb, second and third digit. Okay. And hence the term carpal tunnel. And they call it carpal tunnel syndrome because it's a whole, because it's, it's one pathology, but there's a whole bunch of sequelae like uh, pain, uh, miscoordination or, or discoordination of your, uh, of the movement of your fingers and so on and so forth. That's why uh, in neurologic testing, uh, if you've ever seen it, um, I stick my two fingers out and then I have my patient grip my fingers as hard as they can. And I say, pull, uh, I goes, uh, squeeze, squeeze my hand as hard as you can. And if they have any neurologic uh, regarding their, uh, their hand, uh, I could feel it with the difference of, uh, of the, you know, the grip strength. All righty. So here is your hips or your pelvic girdle. Okay. Now, uh, do, 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 do. these rings down here, these form your ischium. These plates up here is your ilium. And of course, this is your uh, uh, sacrum. Okay. And that forms your whole pelvic girdle. This thing is called your acetabulum. That connects to your proximal epiphysis of your femur or your thigh bone. Now, there are differences between male and female. Of course, the female um, uh, sacrum and um, um, pelvic girdle is going to be wider and deeper to accommodate baby. Male will be thinner and uh, less uh, um, uh, um, a less um, diameter. And again, for future training, you're eventually going to have to know all of this. What's the arcuate line? What is the function of the arcuate line? What is it actually connected to? What are the five pieces of your acetabulum? Oh, I'm getting flashbacks. Ugh, getting flashbacks in medical school. No bueno. But for us, the green ilium. This part here, uh, um, ischium, acetabulum, end of list, move on with our day. Here you go, is another version of it. Oh, here you go. And you can now see the difference between male and female. See how the female is like wider, so it'll accommodate baby more and uh, male is more narrow. Another thing you'll also notice is that there'll be like a more curvature of your sacrum, kind of like a ramp for baby so that, you know, baby can go out. And then we could say that thing that we love saying in obstetrics, baby out. Hmm, let's see. Baby out, Ugh, I used to hate that word or words. Femur, okay. I think we're, I think we're now going into uh, minutia, which we don't need to. Last but not least, let's talk about joints. Joints are classified into three types. And, um, and they're based on um, your, the structural classifications are based on how much they can move. So um, you have fibrous, cartilaginous and synovial. Fibrous, you can't, you totally can't move. Okay. And an example of that is your synarthrosis joints and those you can't move totally. And those are your structures, coronal, your squamous, your lamboid sutures. You cannot move them. All right. Try it. Now, the middle ground is your amphiarthrosis, hence the prefix amphi, like something that's amphibious is neither water nor land, it's both. So amphiarthrosis has a limited mobility, like your intervertebral disc, right? Now, diarthrosis is a fully movable joint, uh, also known as a synovial joint. I'm gonna look at it here.
Where's where, where is it? Messing with me. Oh, here's another example here of a amphiarthrotic joint, your pubic symphysis. Sometimes it even gets detached during childbirth if the baby's too big. But this moves a little bit, especially during pregnancy. But this right here is a classic example of your synovial joint. This is your uh, 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 joint space of your knee. Now you will notice some features. One, articular cartilage, the decreased friction. Two, you have a closed in bursa or pocket, hence the term bursitis, if you've ever heard that for, uh, for uh, arthritis in your joints, right? This fluid has to be sterile and clear and clean. And this is your synovial fluid, which gives this joint full mobility and full range of motion. And then you will also see supporting ligaments all on the outside. And that is a classic synovial joint or fully movable and free joint, also known as a diarthrotic joint. Oh, here's some more. You also have these ligaments that cross over here, your PCL, ACL. Maybe you've heard of them before. Uh, maybe you're a fan of football where your favorite player has an ACL tear or an anterior cruciate ligament. Cruciate just means it's crossing over. So your ACL is, of course, it's the anterior ligament that connects front to back and it crosses over. Your posterior ligament or your posterior cruciate ligament connects back to front and they cross over. And if, you know, your foot gets caught in the, um, you know, artificial turf playing football and your body moves one way and your knee moves another, this gets easily torn. I have, I have an ACL and PCL tears, both my knees because of uh, all those stupid years snowboarding and doing really, really, really dumb things. Like uh, jumping, uh, jumping from UPS truck to UPS truck. Here are more examples of synovial joints. And this is the one maybe if you uh, had a health class or uh, before maybe in high school or at another university when they started talking about pivot joints, hinge joints, ball and socket joints. They're all synovial joints because they're, uh, they're free moving. And they have that classic feature of a synovial joint. And nothing else. Nope, I think that's it. Let's look at all the stuff we were supposed to do. Let's look at our objectives, see if we met them all. And watch these videos, these are nice. This, especially this one, this one's nice, I like this one. So for your next week's concept map, did we talk about the structures of the skeletal system? Yes, we did. Function of bones, yes, we did. Support and movement, how do you, uh, it goes, how do you actually support your body? How do you actually move? Kinda did, in the semi. And of course, joints, the uh, spaces in between bones. And this is also a nice video as well. So with that being said, let's go over what's due next week. Of course, task six, which is uh, your concept map. Discussion six, right? Ooh, Ms. Garcia, good on you. Um, try to find stuff from 2021. 3D printers have been around for more than 10 years. Um, and designing prosthetics have been around for more than, I don't know, uh, since the 1950s. So find, uh, find the newer versions. What makes 3D printing better? Is it cheaper? Is it more made available? And when you make a statement, make sure your statement has something that'll back it up. So let's say, for example, I make up something like 3D printing is much better because it's cheaper and uh, um, uh, is faster than the old school way of sculpting and making a cast and uh, creating prosthetics or, you know, fake arms and fake legs for, uh, for, uh, for people who need uh, stabilizing their bones and their joints. You have to cite something and make sure it's legit. 
um, how many times I comment to you guys, you guys comment on a blog that, you know, this guy Jeff in his basement in Queens, New York, made, New York made. It's not a legit thing, but something like, oh, the American College of uh, Pro uh, Prosthetic Medicine states that in the last five years, 3D printing has improved 300%. 3D printing overall versus traditional um, uh, prosthet uh, prosthetic uh, synthesis uh, improves this, that, and the other thing, according to NIH, according to uh, um, you know this and that. And try to get something from 2020, 2021. A lot of you have N dot, D dot. Um, you know, it's, it's not as, it doesn't make your argument. And just as an, another reminder, when you answer somebody, let's say, for example, Dr. Grimes, I disagree with you. Okay, fine. That's wonderful, right? Or I agree with you. That's fine. That's wonderful. That's only half the game. What do you agree with me about? And do you have further data that can uh, support the original author? If you don't, you're just, it, it just breaks down and becomes uh, what, what we call in academics, mutual adoration society. We also talk about that in um, business. Have you guys ever been to meetings where everyone goes, that's a great idea. That's all wonderful. Everyone's all wonderful. That's not, um, I'm a New Yorker and a pessimist. I'm from, I'm from a play. I'm from a corporate place uh, where we argue all the time and not argue for the argument's sakes, argue for improvement. And um, don't, don't be a yes man or yes woman. It's never a good thing. Uh, innovation is never come from, yeah, I think you did great. No, be critical, but be respectful, of course. But if you totally agree with what somebody's saying, make sure to help bolster their argument as well. Because it, every, every day I listen to my family talk about politics and stupidity, and nobody has any data to back anything up. Oh, because uh, the, the curve is flattening. What curve? What are you talking about? And uh, I had a I had an argument with my my nephew this, this afternoon when I came home. Curve is flattening because uh, they're gonna open up all the borders. Really, who said that? Where did you get that from? No, they're not. And and I opened up the computer and and I showed him 2021 data from this month. And I go, what are you talking about? And he was like. Well, you could pick any data. No, there's legit sources and there's not so legit sources. So be that person to legitimize your argument with facts, not emotion, not hearsay, not, eh, I think it's kind of this, that, not I think, I know for a fact. Lesson six, click on the case. Let's look at, oh yeah, this is the thing where there's a fracture. So. Part one, read the case, answer the questions. Part two, here you go, answer the questions. And then look, it's really easy. It's common sense, right? Part three, answer the questions. I think, uh, yeah, all four, four or five. Make it how does this? Parts one through four, that's all I want. Questions for parts one through four, I repeat. The case study for lesson six, questions one through four only. Don't even go to five, go one through four, and that should be good enough, all right? Because I know what's coming up, the holiday season and the itis. Ooh, someone went all out. Someone already answered everything. Wunderbar. Okay, so. That's what I'll do next week. Let me look at attendance. I have six. Let me count. One, two, three, four, five. Who's my number six? Let me recount. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All righty. It is at this point of the show. You guys know I turn off the recording. 